Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbi alamin. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an Muhammad adhu wa rasulullah. I seek refuge in Allah from the rejected enemy, Shaitan. With Allah's name, the most merciful benefactor, the most merciful redeemer, all praise is due to Allah alone. I bear witness there is no deity except Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger, his servant to mankind. Allah says in the Quran, in the Surah B, he said that if ye can count the favors of Allah, never would ye be able to number them. <coughs> For Allah is all forgiven, most merciful. You know, Many times we go through life and we look at the different aspects about life and we forget the simple, simple aspects about life that Allah has given us over the years, has prepared us, this generation that we're in now. Things had to be uh, prepared for us. Every generation that comes into existence have to have elements in that time period they're in that they can be challenged with and they can grow with, they can develop with. Every civilization, every, every um, society is like that. Allah has blessed man to be able to not only deal with the challenges, but to adapt to the circumstances. And adapting to the circumstances is what makes man victorious. A man is unable to adapt to the circumstances, he would be eliminated. He would be um, not counted anymore as part of the living, because the living would overcome, overcome. It's the same as uh, uh, a garden. You have a garden that produces uh, good plants. You have a garden that um, produces great vegetation, but it's not taken care of. And eventually, that garden will, um, will be overrun by the grass, overrun by the um, vegetation of crabgrass that takes life and root itself in the ground and the earth and grows and strangles the other roots, other plants. Life and civilization is the same way. Every time a civilization comes into existence, if it doesn't continue to evolve on the level on which Allah has planned for man to evolve on, develop on, then a new civilization comes in and strangles out that other civilization. The other civilization lose life. It lose customs, it loses everything. Allah makes it clear in the Quran, he said he will replace one generation with the next, or replace one civilization with the next, if they are not in accordance with his creation, in accordance with the Quran, in accordance with what is revealed in the Quran, he will replace them. Now this is, um, a process that has been going on since man has been in existence. Man has to continue to evolve. Man has to continue to grow. Now we're living in a time now where this is more relevant now than any other time. And it's not so much relevant because we would be replaced, man would be replaced with another species. No, that's not the threat. The threat is not that. It's not a physical threat in terms of species work. The threat is that man can be uprooted by his own neglect to his own growth of his humanity. 
if we neglect our human aspects, then what will grow in us are aspects that are contrary to human development and human life. Why do you see, see such a splurge in our society of homosexuality and different things? I, I was on the, the internet the other day and on a, a site that I thought was pretty decent, I clicked it and had all this nudity on it. And it was a, a site that Muslims go to. And I uh, looked at it and I said, this is, uh, seems to be strange. But it's not strange in the sense that we don't protect it. See, in other words, if we have a site on, on the internet and it's not protected, meaning that anybody just can't put something on there, they have to get the authority of the ministry to, of that site, then the people, whoever want to get to your audience, will put something on there. That's the way the society is. And if you look at the development of this society, you can see it daily. We are being bombarded. We are being bombarded daily with ideas and concepts that can take away the human aspect of the human being. So that the human being will become more savage. And the more the human being becomes more savage, those who are in charge can manipulate and control the human being best. And the human being, once he's in that uh, state of, of being manipulated and controlled, then he becomes an animal. He becomes a workhorse. He becomes something that the society, who has some knowledge, uses to build their heaven, build their heaven on earth, to develop their schemes, to develop their way of life. It's easy to control a person if the person has a habit. It's easy to control a person if a person is a smoker, for example. If you just smoke cigarettes, you can control the person simply by limiting them the use of the cigarette or having some advertisement leading toward the cigarette. It becomes a, a draw on that person. Now, why is it a draw on that person? Because the person had allowed this to come into their physical arena. It first had to get past their mentality. Then it got past that, then it gets into their physical, their physique. And the body is natural. The body will come and adapt itself. See, the body is adaptive. A law created man, uh, a ubiquitous creature. In other words, we're not a creature that's uh, forced to live a certain life because of our environment. We can adapt to almost any environment. This is the human nature. And the body is the same way. Even though when you would begin to smoke, the body would reject it. But if you continue, the body would then adapt to it. But adapting to something like cigarettes is harmful to the body. Even though it's harmful to the body, the body is overcome by your intellect, over, overruled by your rational thinking. I want to do this. And we have all kinds of excuses as to why we do it. And yet we're killing ourselves. And it's the same thing with hard drugs, alcohol, lusting after women, or women after men. They got the society so much now that it's, they, they've turned this lust into three and four women with one man. And three and four men with one woman. They're inviting, inviting your, your natural urge that the law put in the human being for reproduction into something they can use and develop and put money into their pockets. This is the society we're living in right now. We're living in a society that's controlling man through his urges. And if you're not aware of your urges, and not aware of how to control your urges, you will be controlled by someone who is aware of it. And every time you look at a commercial on TV, the art, the skill of the producer of that ad is aiming at your urge. It's aiming at your urge to have food, to eat food, even though you may not be hungry. 
is aiming at your urge to chase women, not because the women are best for you to chase, chase the women, because at the end of it, this person who's stimulating you in such a way is going to make money off of it. This is the society we're living in. Almost you can't get around it. When you turn on your TV, is there. When you turn on your radio, is there. When you pick up your newspaper, is there. Even when you talk to friends on the street, is out in their conversation. The conversation pulls each other from the right side to the left side. It may seem easy, and some of us may think we're not being affected, but we are. And Allah tells us that those who are most affected are those who are on the Sarat of Mustaqeen. You see, because those who are already on that side are on that side. They're going to have to struggle to get back. But those who claim to be on the straight way and are affected by these, this urging that the society uses to pull, they are in the position to pull masses of people to that same thinking, that same ideology, to keep people in the dark. You know, man has come a long way. Man has come a long way in terms of his enlightenment. When Allah says, Kalaka and San, he created man to think. And that particular thinking man has come a long way. He's come a long way from crawling on the caves, living in trees and living in woods and living in, 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 in uh, deserts. He's come a long way from that raw environment to being able to build homes and build areas of living for ourselves to develop such a, a heaven on earth condition that we are in today. Man has come a long way. But what Allah warns us against most are our urges. Allah warns us most against our urges. And he gives us many, many things in to help us control the urges, because it's the urges that are going to pull us down. Allah gives us, for example, salat. Now, many times we go through the ritual, the, the ritual of salat and the, the, um, the making sutra and things of that nature in terms of what we're supposed to do. But the purpose, the real purpose of salat is to help develop moral strength. So if you're going to develop moral strength by making salat, that means you have to pay attention to what you're saying. You have to pay attention to what you're reciting and try to have it become part of you. If it doesn't become part of you every time you do it, then it's for naught in the sense of being of value to you. It's not going to develop your moral consciousness if it's not part of you. If it's not have become part of your nature, there's no way for it to have that lasting effect on you. But what will happen is that you will be listening to the television, listening to the radio, and listening to other people in the street, and watching things on, on, the, on the YouTube and all of those kind of things. And they then will win you over with the urges. <coughs> urges are very difficult. Urges are something that Allah created man for man to be successful with not to be used by. You remember the story of Noah? The story of Noah, you know, the one who uh, Allah had him to build an a, a, a ark and for to save his family and the believers at the time. And on that ark, he instructed Noah to bring every living creature in pairs every living creature and pass and put them on the ark. And then all those who were on the ark, uh, the water would, would come, the rain would rain down 40 days and 40 nights and, and so forth and so on and drown everybody except those on the ark. Have you really thought about that? Do you just read it and say, oh, oh wow, how is that? 
But have you really taken a real deep look at that? Have you really asked yourself, how is it possible to get every creature? Now we don't, there's so many creatures on this planet Earth, we, can, we, don't, we, we don't have them all numbered yet. We're still finding them, by the way. They're in the earth. They're in the water. They're in the air. And they're inside us. Do you know you have living creatures on your skin? In your bed? In your clothes? They can only be seen under a microscope. All these creatures. See, when we hear that, we think of the elephant, we think of the giraffe, we think of these big creatures, but now we're talking about all these billions and billions and billions and billions of creatures. How long would it take Noah to go find them? Let alone bring them back and put them on an ark. Have we really thought about that? The reality. The reality is Allah is talking to us about a condition of the human being. Man had evolved out of the animal type worship. Man had evolved out of worshiping idols and worshiping animals and worshiping stones. Had come to the point where Allah blessed man with the guidance to show Allah is bigger than that. Religion is bigger than that. Your way of life is bigger than that. Not that they, they, they were identified with Allah yet at this point, but they were identifying with religion. They were identifying with a way of life that they could live and have a, 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 harmon, a harmonizing kind of relationship with all the people of, the, of their time. And that concept, that religious idea is what saved them those who believed it. But what came along with that were all the urges, all the urges of the human being. The human being has billions of urges. We have billions of urges in us, and all those urges are like a male and female. All those urges are like a pro and con. One is good, the urge is good, but if it goes one way, it's bad for you. Like the word to love. To love is good. But if you love uh, uh, somebody is going to take you down it works bad for you if you love uh, some, a way of gambling for example if you love gambling that's bad for you but the symptom is still love if you love truth that's good if you love falsehood it's still love how do you think a person could do evil so long and you can see them doing evil and continue to do evil unless they love what they were doing or love the money for what they're doing it for. It's a twofold situation. And Allah is simply telling us in that story, He's saying that look, He's saying, look, we have created you. Thank you very much. We have created you with these urges. And these urges are going to go one way or the other. You have to keep your moral consciousness as the guide. Because the same urge you use to go straight can be used to take you off course. He even says in the Quran that some read this scripture and they go straight by the same ayat. And others read the same ayat and go wrong. What could, what could that be? That means they're urged, they're following another urge. They have the same urge, but something else is influencing that urge. You have urges that you don't even identify with because it's that many. The human being have all the, the natural big ones we, we have an urge to eat. Those kind of things we, we know about. But the, what causes the human being to trigger and respond in a certain way? Well, the human being really saying, I wanted to do that. I, I, I didn't really want to do that, but it's because a human being has a lot of urges. So Allah warns us. He said, look, if you want to control your urges, then you have to control your moral consciousness. You have to control your moral consciousness, and if you can evolve on your own, 
to develop this, great. But in order to assist you, I will give you guidance. I will give you the Quran. That's why it said, Dali Kitabu La Raifi, Huda La Mutakin. That's what he's talking about. He's giving us guidance in this book to help us in our moral development so we can control our urges. You know, this says, Isaiah, if man can count the favors of Allah, we can never number them. There's a, I was talking with someone about a symptom. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's called a Renaissance system, symptom, symptom, Renaissance system, Renaissance symptom. It was discovered by a French doctor, Renaud. And what the symptom is, is that the human being, some people when they get cold, the blood vessels in their outer extremities leave that part and it, it goes into the center part. And, um, and while this is a symptom, what this doctor discovered, that the body, re that's really a false alarm to some people, that the body is not really going to no distress. You see, that, that process is in place for survival. Allah created this process in place for survival. You haven't ever heard the story of, of, of people who got lost and, and, and a, uh, a plane went down or something of that nature and they got lost in this cold place where they didn't have any food and nearly froze to death and then finally they're discovered and found and they're still alive but yet they frostbitten, they have to lose their hands and lose some extremities. Those stories are out there and they're true. And the reason the person survived it because Allah put in the human being a triggering mechanism. A triggering mechanism. And that triggering mechanism that when you begin to get cool, cold, it's sending a signal to all your blood vessels. It's sending a signal to all the blood vessels in your body, something is getting ready to happen. We have to prepare for survival. And there's an emergency, emergency alarm goes off in the body to get ready for survival. And if, that, and if that continues, if the cold continues on the extremities and then the blood begins to leave those areas, outer areas, and start to go inside and come to the central parts of the body where the organs are. So that the organs can survive, so that the heart can survive, so that the liver can survive, so that the kidneys can survive. All those organs, if the organs survive, you survive. Because they can cut off the extremities. But if the organs don't survive, you can't survive. <coughs> so Allah has placed in the human being this survival mechanism, this survival technique that if you get caught out in this, and we're getting some cold now, but you get caught out in the real cold somewhere, it kicks in automatically. You don't even have to tell it. You could be hungry, you could be suffering from lack of water, automatically it kicks in. Because Allah created it in the human being. So even if, if we counted up the favors, this is things we didn't do. This is the mercy of Allah. Some of us may never even use that. Never have to use that. But some of us have. Some people have. And they think they should be thanking Allah for that. So we, we want to take a short pause. <coughs> In closing on the day's khutbah, I just want to reiterate what Allah is saying in the Quran about surviving, <laughs> survival of the human being, and why it's so important that we survive. The human being can do things, and we can almost 
annihilate ourselves. I remember some years back, the fear was that if we got into a world war, another world war, that the human being would become annihilated. But that was uh, the language of um, some of those who um, were in control, and they didn't really consider everybody on the planet a human being, because if it wasn't from Europe, or they didn't have a Euro European background, they weren't considered human. Now, the European wasn't the first to think of that, although that uh, was real heavy in Europe. Uh, it was in Africa, it was in, in fact, the word Bantu and other languages, but some of the tribes really to say, we are human, we are real human, and uh, they are not, who, whoever they are. And, and you have a, such a variety of, of, of uh, human beings on the planet Earth that this almost goes to anybody. When the European first came to this country, the, the, the Native Indian here, the Native, the Native American who was here, he didn't call the European a, a person. They weren't people, they weren't real people. In fact, they were considered to be almost like snakes. They talked with a forked tongue, they, they couldn't trust them. They, didn't, they weren't human beings. See, but that's, that's, the, that's the ground floor. That thinking is the ground floor for all of the other um, racial supremacist ideas that come about. And Europe was filled with, Europe was just another country that was um, invaded with this idea, this thinking of supremacy. And so when they think of world destruction, they are talking about all Europeans. They, they say if the bomb explodes and kill people in Russia, people in America, people in Europe, there won't be no more people. That's because they don't think about all other people in the Andes and, and the other jungle parts of, the, of, of planet Earth. And if Allah brought man out of the jungles originally, he can do it again. See, but that's not the thinking. The thinking is if we Europeans are not sub surviving, no human being survives. That's the way they think. And they're not the only ones, as I said before, of course, we have that thought here in America. America has adopted that way of thinking. America is uh, considered itself the best, the best. And most of it is European American, because the African American is usually struggling with the, the, the idea of being African American. You see in the news, and I just want to make this point, that you see in the news where the Oscar, the Oscars Award, uh, being boycotted by some of the actors and actresses. Um, Jada, Jada Pickett from Pinkett, um, Will Smith's wife and, and Spike Lee, some other people. They talk about boycotting the Oscars. And the reason they want to boycott the Oscars is because no African American <coughs> nominated this year and no one's in the nominee last year, out of the 20 nominees in all the categories. <coughs> you see, that kind of thinking is, is, is fostered by the thinking that, okay, we're gonna make this decision, and we make the decision based on this, and you have no say-so in it. So then you get a response, and the response is what they're trying to do is boycott. But I, I, I had the, the privilege of coming through a time in history where I saw a situation that would tell me that boycott is not right for this time. If you want to get on even footing with anybody in America, any civilization in America, because America is a free market system. When I went to college, when I went to college, the first college I went to was the Winston Salem, North Carolina, and I started around 1961. At that time, they had what they call typical African-American colleges, and, and Winston-Salem was one, Winston-Salem Teachers College. Then they had other ones, A&T, all through the country. African-Americans had the biggest independent educational system, uh, higher education system of any other ethnic group other than those who call themselves the public edu group, educational group. Now, they weren't, we weren't allowed to do certain things in terms of going to Caucasian schools, but in reality, the law said we could do that, but they were, the administrators would keep us out and so forth and so on. Something happened. What happened was 
African American athletes <clears throat> changed the whole thinking of America. Not that they went out and protest. No, they became very good in their profession, very good in what they were doing. They became excellent football players, and they was only playing in African American schools. But these, these, uh, uh, the NFL was predominantly a, a, a Caucasian uh, environment and athletes. And so some of them say, hey, look, we're just not going to play this game without that guy. And they go down to the black schools and start pulling athletes. And these athletes became all pro superior athletes on the NFL level. And what happened, that caused such a ruckus that Bear Bryant, one of the, the leaders of this keep this thing lily white in Alabama University, when this boy from uh, Southern California, African-American running back, and they had to play Alabama in the, in the, in the national playoff, the college national playoff. The boy ran all, all over him. So Bear Bryant told his people, we're not gonna play another season without having an African-American on our team like that. So what happened is that the African-Americans began to produce so much, the demand changed the whole idea of who can go to what school. The demand, the demand that we can't stay on. And see, athletes, I know most of us don't understand the importance of these athletic programs in these schools. The football program in most colleges pay for all of the other programs in that school in terms of their extracurricular programs. Just that one sport. Now, with that in mind, they begin to change. They say, this is about money. Didn't you see what happened just a, a little while ago? Was it three or four months ago? When they, they, this, this, the, out in Missouri, um, one of the schools out, out in Missouri, where these uh, racial things are going on and, and, the, and the people saying, uh, just stop, get them to stop that, stop all this racism in it. Nothing happened. The football team, the, Af the African American football team said, we ain't playing anymore. We're not playing now one more, one more down until something is done. Overnight, overnight things changed and the, the, the president of the university had to step down. Overnight. Why? Because the, those colleges, those athletes feed into what? The NFL. And the NFL ain't going to lose all this money. NFL is the highest run and the best run organization nearly on the planet. It makes more money than any other groups on the planet without failure. It's big money. It's what changes. And I think the same thing can happen in all of these other things. If we don't have to beg to go in anywhere, just create our own conditions. And they would be begging us to come. Create our own conditions in terms of acting, in terms of literature, in terms of art, in terms of all of those things. You're talking about a very productive people. But I'm on the sideline talking because I have not yet acted in the movie at all. So <laughs> this is, this is uh, for those actors and writers to make that kind of decision. But um, I certainly would be a component about, <coughs> you know what, you, what, why, why, Oscar, the Oscar, why don't we have a Robeson? Paul Robeson, those of you who know Paul Robeson was an African American scholar. Robeson Award. Things have changed. I believe things will change and you won't have to argue about it. You will not have to argue with no one at all about where you want to go and what you want to do. Because that's money. When money's involved, things change. Because this is a free market system. And they understand that concept clearly. So it's our job to be able to look at some of these aspects and use them for our advantage and take, a, take, take advantage of opportunities and not see ourselves as going down. And this is primarily with African-American people. Most of our brothers from other parts of the country, they come with an attitude of, of, of building things and doing things because that's what they were doing already. But when we've been here so many years, we've gotten a little comfortable with, let's, let's march and maybe they'll do something more for us. We got a little comfortable with that. We need to get more comfortable with, let's build this ourselves. Let's do this ourselves. You know one thing we talked about here in Elizabeth? 
and this would affect all Muslims. We talked about building an African American cultural center. And now, in days to come, we're going to explain what that entails because it, it's, Islam is at the root of that. See, we understand Islam being the root of a lot of the liberated African Americans in America is because of Islam. It's because of Islam. It's not because of Christianity. And I'm not talking down on the Christian brothers, but it's not because of Christianity. It's not because of Judaism. It's because of Islam. And once we establish a center and begin to show the power of this, then it will begin to affect others. So with that, we want to <coughs> ask Almighty Allah to give us the best of this world, to protect us from the fire, and bless those who were not able to make Jumma today, and those who were sick. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Shadu Allah, Allah, Yulla Allah, Shadu Anna, Muhammad Rasulullah, Ayla Salah, Hila Falah, Kakam Tisla, Kakam Tisla, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, La Yulla Allah.